Good evening. Thank you for joining us for our community conversation on flood mitigation and recovery. My name is Shirley Martinez and I'm the district director for Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher. The Congresswoman and our panelists will give opening remarks and then we will move to questions and answers. On the bottom of the screen is a Q&A which you can click to add your question to the queue. Again, thank you for joining us and I will now hand it over to our host, Congresswoman Fletcher. Thank you so much, Shirley. Uh, thanks to everyone who is with us tonight, um, especially our panelists and hello to everyone in Texas 7 who is joining us tonight virtually for our community conversation. Um, if you can't tell already, um, I sound a little different tonight because I have lost my voice this week. Um, and this is the first thing I've really said since Monday, um, which is a real challenge in this job. Um, so I'm gonna keep my remarks very brief um, and then turn it over to Ben Jackson, who is our district's uh, deputy chief of staff and legislative director. He's been on our team uh, since day one, um, and he's actually been uh, working in Congress longer than I have. So we're really lucky to have him um, helping lead the efforts for our office. And he's worked extensively on uh, so many of the issues on flood mitigation, um, projects and uh, all the things we're going to talk about tonight. So he's going to give a brief congressional update um, that I would ordinarily give before my voice goes out. Um, but I want to thank you all for being here. And I really want to thank our panelists who joined us again. Um, this was the very first community conversation that we did. Um, first town hall in my first year in office. Um, many of you who are with us tonight were there and have been every year since. Um, at what has become an annual event to talk about one of the most important issues in our district. Um, and we're lucky to be joined again tonight by several of the people who have worked so well, so collaboratively with our Texas 7 congressional team um, since day one. So I'm really excited tonight uh, to be joined by Colonel Tim Vail, the Galveston District Commander for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and with him tonight, Lieutenant Colonel Rhett Blackman, who's the incoming Galveston District Commander for the Corps. Uh, he will take over command from Colonel Vale this summer. We will be very sad to see Colonel Vale go, um, but we know he's gonna stick around here in Houston. So looking forward to seeing how we can work with him next and very excited to work with Colonel Blackman um, on these projects moving forward. Uh, he's not here in Houston yet, so it is a real um, testament to the um, the importance of the work for our district that he's joining us tonight in advance of taking command. Um, and I'm just really excited for him to hear from people in our district um, about our concerns and about how we work together to solve the, the problems that we face here. Uh, we also have a familiar face to many, Alan Black, who is the Director of Engineering and Construction for Harris County Flood Control, uh, who's been a terrific partner. And of course, uh, Steve Costello, the Chief Recovery Officer for City of Houston, who's been with us since the beginning as well, um, and who was really uh, the source of a lot of the good ideas that we have had in Congress and the work that we've done and been able to do for our district. So um, each, of the, each of the leaders that are assembled here tonight on our panel have an important perspective to bring to our discussion um, and a lot of updates. So we will get right, right to it. Um, I'm so grateful to all of you for being here with us. Um, and for your ongoing collaboration um, since, since we got here. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing your updates for uh, the 7th Congressional District and also um, excited to turn it over to Ben um, and, and have him share some of the, the great news that we have um, for our district, uh, especially in this first quarter of the year. So Ben, I will hand it over to you and thanks so much for, for doing the update and thanks again to everybody for being here. Thank you, Congresswoman. Whether introducing legislation to increase the speed of disaster mitigation and recovery projects or delivering federal funding for water infrastructure projects, flood mitigation efforts are always top of mind for everyone in our office. There are many ways we have worked to do this over the years, and I'm glad to give you an update from our team. Last month at the Congresswoman's request, Congress appropriated nearly $10 million for the Meyer Grove Detention Basin, which will be constructed just inside the 610 loop at North Bracewood. This project will provide significant protection for the Meyer land area. This is what's called a community funded project, a new process this last year for members of Congress to apply for funding for projects in their districts. 
I'm glad to report to you that every project we requested was funded and Meyer Grove is a great example of the program. It's a great example of our partnership with the city of Houston and Harris County to identify and support projects together. Another water infrastructure project the Congresswoman requested that Congress funded this year for 782,000 was federal funding to improve water distribution and wastewater collection in Bel Air. The funding will be used to continue the progress already made in addressing the deficient water line infrastructure along street blocks in the Bel Air community. In keeping with the prioritization of water infrastructure projects, the Congresswoman also requested and secured $624,835 to replace water lines for approximately 55 homes on Seattle Street in Jersey Village. The entire street will receive new storm sewer lines that will help remove rain from streets and hold it in larger stormwater pipes to help prevent street flooding and reduce the chance of home flooding. To succeed, we need to work together to strengthen existing systems while implementing new projects and smart policies. Another area of constant work for us in the ongoing recovery and mitigation projects in the Buffalo Bayou watershed. Our community has shown overwhelming support for the study of underground tunnels to alleviate the potential for flooding along Buffalo Bayou. Our office has worked to facilitate the extension of the Buffalo Bayou tributaries and resiliency study to make sure our community need community's needs and priorities are heard. The Army Corps of Engineers worked with our office and approved additional funds last year to allow an extension of the study, which will enable the Corps to continue studying underground tunnels as a potential water conveyance solution. I'll let the Corps discuss more of the work relating to the study and also the Coastal Texas Study Project to protect our region and our country from catastrophic, catastrophic damage from storm surge on the Texas coast. The Congresswoman testified before Congress this year on the importance of authorizing the Coastal Texas study in this year's Water Resources Development Act, and has also testified about the importance of funding for the coastal resiliency projects. We have been working on these issues since day one. Our entire team is grateful for the input of the community members on these matters, including all of you who have joined our conversation tonight, and for the work and the partnership of our panelists. With that in mind, I will turn it over to the panelists for an update on their work, and then we'll turn to questions submitted through the Q&A feature. And starting with Colonel Vale now. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Congresswoman. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with your constituents and with this esteemed, uh, what I consider a group of collaborators um, yet again. Uh, just to, to everybody, there's just no, there's no greater sense of reward and, and accomplishment than, than collaborating with the individuals that I'm gonna be speaking with tonight between the federal, the state, the county and the city. I just think this is just a wonderful team trying to, to find a way to yes on just about every potential solution to all these challenges that we face. And particularly in Harris County where we, we deal with largely what I consider some of the most challenging flood risk reduction kind of problem sets that, that we face anywhere in the nation. And I speak from experience as somebody who's worked largely everywhere in the nation these are the toughest challenges that are, that are before the Corps of Engineers and, and the state, the county, and the city. And we're just proud that we're working seamlessly together to try and find the right solutions. For that, I think I'll talk specific to, to Buffalo Bayou, first and foremost. As it stands, last week we were supposed to conduct a, 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 an agency milestone called uh, the Tentative Select Plan. Where we're gonna, we were gonna release what our tentative plan was. And, and at that point in time, based on the extension of analysis that you had asked, that the community had asked for, and the Congresswoman supported, and that we received from, from the administration, um, we were able to continue to evaluate the study. And at this point in time, right before the tentatively selected plan, we had determined, and we have determined, that from a cost benefit perspective, kind of tunnels are indeed. Um, a better solution set in the channel expansion. Um, so that is a direct, I would consider it victory to, to open the core opening itself up to receive really the valuable, valuable feedback throughout this process. Um, so for the first time, largely in the history of Buffalo Bayou, we're recognizing a solution set that is not um, potentially channel expansion. Um, and, and that should be news, news and somewhat from, from our feedback, something that should be celebrated from a, a large swath of the constituency. Um, at the same time, though, the cost benefit situation, even with the tunnels, leads us to a, a, new, a new way of looking at things that we're trying to do for the Corps of Engineers. We want to participate in the solution very much. 
But to do so, we have to, the, the cost of a tunnel system, uh, particularly from Addison Barker Reservoir all the way to the ocean, is largely going to be in the magnitude in excess of $6 billion. So largely what our challenge is, is to find, quantify in a measurable way benefits that kind of meet that cost of $6 billion. Now the framework that the court traditionally uses to say, hey, the citizens of Iowa want to be part of this solution, the, the federal interest for all 50 states in terms of delivering this solution set, traditionally comes from a very direct analysis of, 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 of what this solution set would actually prevent in terms of damage to infrastructure. What we recognize is when we evaluate damage to infrastructure, we leave the most probably the most critical component of infrastructure out of the equation, and that's people. We evaluate the structures that are going to be inundated, and we put a general valuation in terms of what the impacts of those homes are in a flood, but we don't really evaluate the people that live in those homes and how they contribute to broader society um, and to a larger economy. So we're trying to expand the way we quantify benefits so that we can come up with what I consider the term parity, at least a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of benefits to cost. And to do so, Harris County Flood Control District has really helped us along the way. So what we've asked to do is stop the clock. You know, we're underneath this congressional timeline um, and, and administration timeline to complete the study. But we want to get those benefits right that really consider the expanded economic opportunities that are, and costs associated with flooding and the other societal effects of flooding and really chart new territory for the Corps of Engineers in terms of how we propose recommendations to our policymakers in Congress to really evaluate, you know, federal participation in a solution set. So as a result, we've gotten approval from the administration for the federal government to put a pause on where we're at from the engineering solution set so that Harris County Flood Control District can continue to, to do its comprehensive, what we call it a comprehensive benefits analysis, largely to get us as close to parity as possible so that policymakers can see the whole suite of benefits that are typically, uh, that would be associated with delivering a tunnel solution set. Now, how long that pause lasts really comes down to how much time it's going to take to get for Harris County Flood Control District to, to, to do the analysis and make the right arguments to policymakers. At such time that that analysis is done and we convince policymakers that we're, we're, as clo we're close enough to parity to, to, to move the project to completion, we'll move the project to completion and provide that final, the, the first, the draft the draft solution and environmental impact statement, and then a final solution and environmental impact statement. Um, so largely I'll, I'll use Alan to talk about comprehensive benefits a little bit further and give you an idea of where we're going. Um, but there's all sorts of opportunity uh, for continued constituents participation to help broaden the horizon of how we traditionally measure the benefits of flood risk reduction projects along the way. So I, I open that up to, to everyone um, you can engage me, you can engage Alan Black, um, and it's, it's a worthwhile effort, and I'm really excited about it because we just brought the Assistant Secretary of the, Ar the Army down to Attucks and Barker Reservoir. He said specifically, this is what the Corps should be doing. Um, so with that, Alan, and, Alan Black and the Harris County Flood Control District and myself are very excited to have his, his level of support for, for being the first in the nation to try and really present comprehensive benefits in a different manner. Um, and I think it's largely what people have been asking for for the Army for quite some time. So it's good to be kind of the first in show in that, that regard. Even though it's taken us longer to kind of chart new territory than we had hoped, um, we are charting new territory with an eye towards getting a yes at the end of the day. Secondly, I'd, I'd bring up Coastal Texas. So Coastal Texas, largely the single largest engineering recommendation ever proposed from the Army Corps of Engineers to the United States Congress under the Army Civil Works Program is, is we're waiting on congressional authorization and believe that we've got wide support for congressional authorization. I can't speak to what the ultimate vote in Congress is gonna be ahead of this year's Water Resource Development Act, um, but there's reasons there's reason to be optimistic based on just the amount of support we receive from, from, from members of Congress to include Congresswoman Fletcher. At the same time, our goal is to move forward with the study. We're, we're able to move forward with the study into the next phase called pre-construction engineering design, 
we're able to do that even prior to congressional authorization. Now that next phase of the, the next phase of that project is to deliver the, the first set of plans and specifications for the first contract that we would award underneath that $30 billion program. Now that first contract that we, we would award would be the ecosystem restoration project for Follett's Island um, with our non-federal sponsor, the Texas General Land Office. So our focus there is to, to complete pre-construction engineering design as soon as humanly possible either using funding that we find available within FY in this current fiscal year or funding that we, we get in, in next year, next fiscal year, but to move forward with the Texas General Land Office and deliver that first set of plans and specs. Because what that'll do is it'll move us out of the investigations phase into the construction phase. And once you're in the construction phase, then you're gonna see kind of large, large pieces of money at a time to deliver coastal Texas. Um, so at the same time, what we would do in the construction phase as early as 2023 is spend about a million dollars to bring the best and the brightest nationally and internationally together to figure out how exactly we need to design and ultimately construct and deliver the gate structures from Bolivar Island to the existing Galveston, uh, Bolivar Peninsula to the existing Galveston Island across the Houston ship channel. So that would be it's the largest feature of the Coastal Texas project. We, we want to spend a million dollars to get the, the design and acquisition strategy and the approach for getting that uh, right. We want to do that next year, um, and we're prepared to do that next year. Um, and then, quite honestly, it takes about five years to design that gate structure. And the fastest anything of that size and magnitude has ever been constructed worldwide has been about 12 years. So the clock's kind of ticking for us because we want to outpace the next storm for sure. Um, so we're moving with a sense of purpose um, with a firm commitment from our non federal sponsors, the Gulf, you know, Gulf Coast Protection District and the Texas General Land Office. But every we overcome every obstacle and we find a way to, to, to deliver this because it's important for the nation to deliver the Coast Protection Program in, in that regard. Um, I think there's a lot going on. Um, I think I'll, I'll probably hold it there and make room in time for, for feedback and or questions. Um, particularly if there's questions, um, I'm, I'm here throughout the meeting if you want to address Clear Creek or any other of the uses, projects, or activities. Uh, other than that, I'll turn it back over to you, Beth. Great. Right. Thank you, Colonel Vale. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Alan Black with Harris County Flood Control. Awesome. Well, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for having me here. here. Uh, Congresswoman Fletcher, it's my privilege. Really appreciate the invitation. I hope you uh, start to get your voice back soon. Um, Colonel, I, I really couldn't have said a lot that better myself. Uh, we, we get things done through collaboration. So thanks to you all for your partnerships on getting things done. Uh, but but and, and Congresswoman Fletcher, you've already mentioned it, but I have to, to give you another shout out for the the a big thank you for the $10 million for the, uh, the Meyer Grove Stormwater Detention Basin uh, using FY22 funds. We're always excited. I, I, you know me, I like to say every hole in the ground is a good hole in the ground, especially when it's a hole in the ground in the Braves Bayou watershed. So we're excited to be able to, to get our hands on those funds and start putting them to, uh, to work for, for the residents in Braves. Now, the, the flood control district bond program projects that we have ongoing in the 7th district, they all continue at a, at a rapid pace. You know, we look at things in the near term to start. We're wrapping up the Braves Federal Project, another great partnership with the Corps of Engineers. $480 million over the last 20 years finally coming to an end. And frankly, we plan to celebrate that come this summer. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we've got a number of partnerships all around the area looking at what we can do to make things better. We've just wrapped up a partnership in the city of Bel Air, looking at some, uh, some flood risk reduction efforts there. We've got a study that for a little while was kind of on pause over near Gessner and I-10, looking at some of the tributaries that, that drain into the Buffalo Bayou watershed. Well, the, finally, the timing is finally coming into alignment with some complementary efforts that the city of Houston is working on, some of which actually also is receiving some of those federal community funding projects uh, that, uh, that we're all looking forward to. We've got a massive undertaking in the Attics and Barker Reservoir watersheds to restore design capacity to all those channels flowing into the reservoirs. And all this work, it does more and more to reduce the risk of flooding for our residents. One of the other things we're looking forward to is the opportunity to potentially expand uh, excavation within the Attics and, uh, and Barker Reservoirs 
Uh, flood Control District is working with the Corps of Engineers, as is the Willow Fork Drainage District. So hopefully we can see some dirt flying out of those reservoirs, uh, maybe even as soon as uh, later this year. Uh, I do have to, to give my public service announcement. Of course, if you live in Harris County, you are at risk for flooding year round, not just during hurricane season. So please, we encourage you all to consider buying flood insurance. Now we also keep our eyes on the horizon. What are the projects beyond the bond program? Because a $5 billion bond program is a great start, but in Harris County, the need is so much greater. That's why, as the Colonel mentioned, we are working closely with them on the BBTRS, the Buffalo Bayou Tributaries and Resiliency Study. But we've also got a locally led study of large stormwater dia large diameter stormwater tunnels it has tremendous potential, not just in the Buffalo Bayou watershed, which is where we're using kind of as our as our as our jumping as our as our, our springboard, but also across the entire county. We want to effectively expand that study and kind of merge it in with the BBTRS effort to, to federalize that concept of a countywide system of tunnels. It won't come cheap. And as the, 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 the Colonel mentioned, the, the benefits that need to be captured to show that these are good projects goes well beyond the benefit cost ratio, which is what has typically been used to justify federal investments. To really start to capture those comprehensive benefits of a system of tunnels. And a, a, a simple way of looking at some of those additional benefits is, is think about, you know, we would normally just capture the, the avoided damages of a home that flooded, but there's so much more that happens after a flood. It takes a person a week or two weeks or three weeks to get back to work. Sometimes they can't get back to work to allow other people to get back to the work. You know, teachers need to be able to get back to school so the kids can go to school so their parents can go to work. Those are the sorts of comprehensive benefits that we're working to capture and show why truly this is a project and these are good projects that will work across the county. These are the sorts of analyses that align with the priorities of Congresswoman Fletcher, of Congress, and of the President of the United States. We look forward to continuing that partnership with the Corps, with the City of Houston. I'm going to turn it over to Steve here in a minute, but again, Thank you for having me here tonight. Thanks for your time. And I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Alan. Um, you know, so we're now going from the much larger projects to what I would call regional projects with flood control to more specific projects with the city of Houston. And I, I want the viewers to understand the significance of what Colonel Vale just described in terms of the federal requirements of benefit to cost, uh, because we have all in my entire career looked at that and thought that it was not an equitable approach to justifying projects. And I still have projects that I'm using federal resources for right now, and I still have to comply with the current benefit to cost approach to all of our projects. So I'm gonna briefly just talk about three projects that impact the residents within uh, the district. And, and I think they're significant. The first one, which is really on the on the lower east side of the district on Buffalo Bayou, which is our North Canal project. It is a hazard mitigation grant project funded by FEMA with partners with Harris County Flood Control District, the city of Houston, TxDOT, and the local TERS, which is Memorial Heights. We have finished our preliminary engineering analysis. We're in the process of doing some environmental testing before we move on to final design. It's an exciting project. It's one of the marquee projects that the mayor is really, really considering a concern. And it impacts Buffalo Bayou from right at downtown all the way up past Shepherd Drive. And then on White Oak Bayou, all the way up into the, uh, actually all the way up past I-10 up to 11th Street. So it's an exciting project that's gonna benefit a lot of people out there. The other project that is another hazard mitigation grant project funded by FEMA, which Alan was re referring to early over in the Memorial City area is our subterranean detention basin, uh, working with TERS 7. And it's a, it's a very interesting project. It's a subterranean detention basin. We'll be routing drainage coming off of the Memorial City Mall area into a subterranean detention basin to provide protection to the people that live along the Gessner corridor. And it'll also allow flood control to then proceed on with their project that they're looking on as well. So, that's where we're collaborating. The, the one project that I think is really unique that is not really federally funded. And what it is, it's a, I call it the Rafino landfill site. 
and it really impacts the residents of Bel Air and West U. Uh, Rufino is a landfill that's owned by the resident owned by the city of Bel Air and West U, and it's located in 59 and Beltway 8 area in the Keegan's Bayou watershed. And it's really unusual. It's an abandoned landfill with inside the city limits of Houston. And so we're working with flood control district to figure out a way to convert that landfill to a regional detention basin to accommodate future expansion of Keegan's Bayou to provide flood protection complementary to the Bray's Bayou federal project upstream. So we're really excited about that project, how it helps the city of Bel Air and West U since they own the site. Rather than buying the site, we're going to be working in collaborative effort with both cities to figure out ways that we can help them implement parts of their master drainage plan. And we'll figure out a way to provide mitigating detention to offset those effects that they're gonna be doing in their improvements in the Brace Bayou watershed. So that's a real exciting project. And uh, so we hope, to, we hope to be kicking that off relatively soon. So I didn't wanna spend a lot of time talking about all of our projects because I know there's, everyone has a lot of concerns, and a lot of questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to the Congresswoman and the, and the team and, and be happy to answer any questions that residents might have. Great, thank you, Steve. Well, uh, with those introductions, we'll move to our Q&A portion uh, here for the evening. Uh, and you can use the Q&A function here in the Zoom chat to submit questions. Uh, we've already had a bunch submitted. And with that, I will start with the first questions that we have. Uh, I'm gonna go to it once here because they're both kind of related. Uh, Christina Zini wanted to know an update on the Addicts Barker Army Corps study in terms of when we might see a final study and what that timeline would look like. And Catherine Clark asked, are there, where do the considerations for the tunnel system stand? And I know you all talked about it in your intro a little bit, but if you want to go more in depth into that, I think we're, we're getting lots of questions on where those, where, the, where that project stands. Sure. Uh, so prior to April 6th, we, we had planned to complete the Buffalo Bayou tributaries uh, and tributaries resiliency study by December of 2023. The need to do this comprehensive benefits analysis really um, to, to, to make the argument for federal participation in actually constructing tunnels is potentially going to add a year on to that schedule. Now, we will try, uh, Harris County Flood Control District is going to be doing that work for us in terms of the comprehensive benefits analysis. I say a year because uh, that gives him some, gives the flood control district plenty of room uh, to get a large swath of input to make sure we leave no benefits behind. Um, uh, um, but we'll try and get it done as close to the December 23 original timeline as possible. Um, we just already have largely the, the blanket approval um, to stop the federal clock um, where we would have to be finished by December 23. Um, in terms of some additional things related to Addison Barker that, that Alan made reference to, we have received a, our first uh, real estate application uh, to potentially start excavation behind Addicts and Barker. We're looking at both Harris County Flood Control District doing um, some degree of excavation operations and Willow Fork Drainage District doing what we consider largely recreational type terrain shaping, um, uh, uh, particularly within that watershed that won't cause any uh, impact to the rate of rise within the reservoir, um, but allows increased capacity. Um, you know, that's going through the engineering and design of what that, that landscaping, it's really a landscape architecture type project that ultimately will remove more dirt. Um, that's, uh, you know, basically the yeses are there from us. We're just helping uh, Willow Fork Drainage District figure out exactly what the activity is going to look like behind there um, so that uh, they can get started on that. I, I do know they're looking for sources of funding. Um, to actually conduct that type of landscape architecture work behind there. Um, over. Great, right. thank, thank you, Colonel Vale. Um, our next question that we have comes from Christopher Doherty. Uh, he wants to know what can be done to overcome the GLO's failure to send Harvey recovery funding to Houston in particular and coastal Texas where the Harvey damages were the greatest. Um, Mr. Costello, if you wanna go here, I think you are probably yeah, I was hoping not to have that question, but yes. Uh, you know, it's interesting what most residents don't realize in any type of harbor recovery, FEMA dollars flow through the Texas Division of Emergency Management 
and then HUD dollars flow through the GLO. And the city historically has had an excellent relationship with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. And we've had somewhat of a strained relationship with GLO. And it really goes back to the CDBG DR Harvard Recovery on Home Repair. And, and I think the issue there is that uh, there was a probably a lack of confidence with GLO and the city relative to implementation of mitigation projects. That's the first thing I think. Uh, a lot of people say it could be political. We're not quite sure. I, I think what we need to do is just continue to work through the process. We, we've worked with HUD directly and with our congressional leadership to ask for support to get additional funding and we will continue to do that. Um, I think uh, one of the challenges we're gonna have is once we see the action plan from Harris County, we'll see how many funds are gonna be spent with inside the city limits of city of Houston. And then we'll go back to, rather than go back to GLO, we'll go back to the local COG, which is HEAC, because they have a half a billion dollars as well. And we will visit with them. So I think both the state agency, as well as our sister agencies here locally, understand the needs of our, our citizens. And we will continue to try to work through those as best we can. So I'll, I'll pitch in here as well uh, from the county perspective. Uh, there's been a lot in the news about uh, the proposed $750 million to Harris County. Uh, the first thing it's important to realize is that the flood control district is a separate entity from Harris County. And so from, a, from today's perspective, uh, we have to uh, wait until Harris County releases what's called a, a, a draft method of distribution. That helps to lay out the criteria about how that $750 million will be spent. We got some really good ideas and we, uh, we, we certainly look forward to the conversations, but the public has the opportunity first to comment on how, uh, the, how that 750 is spent and the criteria used to establish those projects, uh, at which point then we'll be able to answer more specifically the sorts of questions like, hey, what projects are we gonna build with the 750? We have to wait until that method of distribution comes out, but uh, they are working on that and uh, we look forward to seeing the next steps. Great, thank you, Alan, and thank you, Steve. Um, our next question comes from Bruce Bennett, and he has concerns about how the coastal spine is going to mitigate flooding in the Houston and Galveston area, and is worried that, you know, the, what colloquially had been referred to as the Ike Act before would hold water into the region. Uh, so, Colonel Vale, do you want to talk about, you know, the importance of this project and how it relates to the overall flooding strategy for the region? Yeah, sure. So, um, I think that, let me unpack that. The first, the first question was, largely kind of an engineering question. Um, you know, when you build a wall against the ocean, do you create a bathtub behind it is kind of what I think that question is alluding to. So take it to the bank. The Corps has no authority to increase the risk to public safety from the compound flood risk associated with the coastal storm. So we have to account for the most likely rainfall um, that occurs um, with the, the, the 600 storms that we modeled um, to provide the level of protection with the design uh, that will commence with building um, largely the, the floodgates, um, not just on, not, not just across the, the, the Houston Ship Channel, but also the floodgates that were, we recommended for Clear Lake and Dickinson. As right, right of that, this, the, the terminology the Corps uses is minimum, minimum facilities criteria. We have a do not harm um, type uh, guidelines and engineer circular that tells us we cannot, we can't transfer risk largely from protecting from storm surge and transfer that risk to increase the prob probability of imminent flooding. Uh, we have to do a largely a do no harm type situation. Um, so as a result, when we build gates uh, or walls, uh, we have to build pump stations. We have to be able to replicate the, the same amount of flow that traditionally would occur without the gates as with the gates. And that's a very specific design criteria that the core um, is, is responsible to, to upholding. And we'll have to demonstrate that to the public before we actually uh, get towards the, the final design and to, to the construction phase of the project. Um, so those concerns are near and dear to our heart. Those, those are requirements that we have um, under our own engineering regulations. Um, so uh, in terms of funding, I can only speak to the federal side of the funding. Um, the Gulf Coast Protection District is still somewhat in, in its infancy. 
uh, but has great leaders uh, on that, uh, you know, representing our non federal sponsor for the gate structures. Um, and they're looking at an all of the above approach and whatever I can do to help them develop an overall concept for delivering this project that allows them to maximize an all of the above approach, we'll do so. I mean, they are partners and not just partners in name only. Um, we'll develop a concept of delivering this 50-50 between the federal government and, and the, the Gulf Coast Protection District. Um, and that's for the coastal storm features. And the same applies to the Texas General Land Office, who's our 50-50 partner for, for delivering the almost $3 billion in ecosystem restoration projects along the whole of the coast. Um, I just know the Texas General Land Office is very, very excited and is even potentially willing to develop a concept that allows them to accelerate ahead of federal funding to get those ecosystem restoration projects done. Um, so there's a lot of momentum. We have to keep making, we, we got to keep making what I consider tactical steps forward to keep the strategic momentum going to deliver something of this magnitude, um, which really is the state of Texas showing the rest of the nation how to get things done. Great, thank you, Colonel Vale. Uh, next, we have Cheryl Novak, who asked, where, where can constituents go for more information about which proposed project projects affect which areas uh, within the region? Well, I can start. Um, the, the, the Harris County Flood Control District's website, www.hcfcd.org, on the very front page, uh, includes an interactive map that you can select, you can expand it to fill up your entire screen, uh, there's some layers that you can turn off and on. If you want to see what's in the seventh congressional district, you can turn on the congressional districts and see all the projects uh, that are within that area. You can zoom into your the, the area you live. You can see all the projects that we have underway locally. Uh, select one of them. It'll tell you what that project is, uh, some of the, the very high level statistics on it, uh, but also gives you the, the keywords that you can then easily reach out to the flood control district uh, you know, uh, tap the button on our website to ask us a question. We'll get back with you usually the same day. Um, and, uh, and we're always ready to answer questions about what we're up to and to, to hear what, uh, what your concerns are. We have a similar issue here with the city. We have a website. Uh, I always encourage everybody to get on the city's website. Just go to Public Works and then go to Build Houston Forward. Uh, but most of those projects are usually much smaller in terms of the impact to the community. But you'll see not only drainage related and street related improvements, but you'll see all the other utility projects as well. Uh, however, our website to be candid is not as nice as flood controls. They've done a really good job of identifying their activities. Great, thank you, Alan. Yeah, I guess I'll cap that out then. Is, um, thanks to Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, after Hurricane Harvey, she funded the Corps of Engineers to conduct a, a watershed assessment, largely to propose recommendations to get at exactly what you're talking about, is how do we see everything the federal government, the state, the county, and the city are working on together in kind of an integrated water resource type framework. Um, so fortunately, at the same time, the Texas Water Development Board was given authority by the state of Texas to also participate um, with authority in flood risk reduction. So between the partners that you hear that you see here today, Steve Costello, Alan Black, and myself, we're working uh, either as direct members or contributing members to Texas Water Development Board's region planning group to start to get all of our information from all federal agencies, state agencies, the county, and the city in one type interactive um, uh, kind of knowledge base for, for the constituents. Thank you, Colonel Vale. Next, we have Kay Wilson, who wants to know uh, if cleaning the waterways if, uh, along the city and the county, will that reduce flooding? And is that something that the county is working on? She sees a lot of uh, dirty waterways in her neighborhood. So cleaning the waterways wouldn't necessarily um, uh, help to reduce the risk of flooding, uh, but when, when the water does have a lot of sediment load in it, it is indicative of uh, erosion upstream. And that can be a sign of some of our infrastructure starting to fail. Um, and so when we see a lot of sediment, we, we wanna know where that's coming from. And so we start to trace upstream until we see, oh, well, if we've got a, a bank that's eroded or, or failed that needs to be fixed, then we need to, to, to jump on that and prioritize that. 
but that's largely oriented more towards uh, retaining the current capacity of, of our systems. Yeah, I think also um, there are a lot of ditches uh, that we call orphan ditches uh, in, in my career these 45 years, and that was nobody claimed ownership. Either the city didn't claim ownership nor the county. And so what we're trying to do now, we set up a program a couple of years ago between both agencies to where we're kind of swapping uh, maintenance requirements or maintenance, I would say maintenance needs. And so what we decided to do is we, we went to flood control and said, hey, our, we do best maintaining closed systems and you do best maintaining open systems. So we have some open systems we wanna to give to you. We'll take your closed systems. And once we get that inventory of those ditches and enclosed storm sewer systems separated out, we will then approach the orphan ditches and figure out who should take those over and, and what we wanna do with them. So at the long term, that's what we'll be doing, but it's, it's primarily a maintenance related issue that we're focusing on. Well, and I'll expand on that to say that uh, while in the process of transferring ownerships of those open channels, or transferring ownership of the enclosed systems, we also make sure that it's caught up to our current standards. Uh, because these, some of these channels have been neglected for, for so long, just because nobody uh, had a responsibility for them, um, sometimes they've fallen into disrepair. So one of the key elements in establishing that transfer of ownerships is also getting it up to standards, which will also help, again, restore these systems back to their original design capacity. Great. Thank you, Alan and Steve. Uh, next, we have Gerda Gomez, who is asking about plans uh, and updates uh, to develop Rufino. And Steve, I know you mentioned this briefly in your intro remarks, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about where the project currently stands and what is ongoing uh, with that site. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So we have been working with Flood Control to develop a, uh, I would say, a joint application to uh, TEDM to access COVID has a mitigation grant funds. The state was awarded to, from FEMA a little over $670 million. And there's a call for projects and those project applications are due the end of this month. And so we hope that we have a consultant looking at our BC analysis, very similar to what Colonel Vale had described earlier to see if we have an application that would be uh, qualify under the federal program. So it'll be, what we're looking at is partial improvements to Keegan's downstream of Beltway 8 and possibly excavating out the portion of the Rafino landfill site that's owned by Bel Air. Uh, in the future, we'll look at the other parcel, which is owned by WestU. It's an exciting time. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever relocated a landfill site of this magnitude. And what I envision, and I'm not a visionary, I'm an engineer, I wanna build things, but what I envision happening at the end of the day, assuming we relocate that entire landfill, that it would look more like an art story park that's located up on Beltway 8 that the county has done an outstanding job of converting a regional detention facility into wetland mitigation and park amenity. That's what I think will happen down there in the future. One of the things I'd, I'd add to that, and this is something that, that we're working to do a better job at, is to help, it, help explain to the public how certain projects while on their own are gonna provide some benefits, they fit in, in together and part of a bigger program. So the flood control district is currently underway with a, a study of the entire Keegan's Bayou watershed. Uh, and part of the, uh, the, the challenge that we have is we want to improve the channel conveyance, but again, we are not allowed, we are a no adverse community, so we can't transfer the risk of flooding to somewhere else. So if we open up the channel and allow more water to flow through, we have to hold some of it back somewhere, like in the Rafino Hills stormwater detention basin. So that's how these projects all kind of interlink, is that flood control would like to improve conveyance. The city is interested in that detention, so that way they can work together to build a, even more flood risk reduction for the residents. Okay, great. Uh, David and Libby asked, over four years after Harvey, residents of upstream Barker Reservoir are dealing with more upstream development and other issues. Are the Corps and Harris County Flood Control working on some incremental solutions while the study of the tunnel options continues? And can you all talk about that? So I'll start and then I'll hand it over to, to the Colonel. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll primarily start with 
Uh, we in Harris County have some of the most stringent development criteria uh, across the, the, the country, if not the most. Um, every development is required to analyze the pre and post conditions of their proposed project and make sure that they incorporate into their development uh, appropriate mitigation, those stormwater detention basins for the communities that hold that water back and slowly release it into the, uh, the outfalling channel. Um, but then also we have talked a little bit about uh, our opportunities to expand some of the, uh, the, 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 the volume of the reservoirs, but I want to put a little perspective on that and, and, and perhaps the Colonel can then chime in on it as well, is that the, each one of those reservoirs, Attics and Barker, hold more than 200,000 acre feet of, of water. The Harris County Flood Control District, since we were created in 1937, has executed about 62,000 acre feet of volume across the entire county. So I, I like to help people hear those numbers to appreciate the scale upon which those reservoirs hold water. And with that awe-inspiring uh, figure, I'll turn it over to, to the Colonel if he wants to add anything. Sure, I think Alan and I share a concern that, uh, you, know, um, you know, upstream residents, um, largely could benefit by increasing the rate of flow from their neighborhoods and developments upstream um, into the reservoir. The faster you can get the, the water out of the neighborhoods and into the reservoir, largely if you live upstream, the better. We just have to reconcile that with, there's only so much capacity within the reservoir. At a certain point in time, we don't want, we, you know, largely we have to operate the reservoir. Here, I'll throw these numbers because they're somewhat similar. The reservoirs right now can only discharge 15,000 cubic feet per second at maximum discharge. That's 15,000 basketballs per second is, is how much water can be released from these reservoirs. During Hurricane Harvey, the amount of water that was coming in behind the reservoirs, the inflow was over 200,000 cubic feet per second. So the 200,000 basketballs were coming into the reservoirs and only 15,000 were able to be released. So at a certain point in time, you, you've got to you've got to either increase the capacity of the reservoir, and that's limited um, in terms of, of of how much capacity you can add behind the reservoirs. So you run into the water table, quite honestly. Um, and then you've got to be able to increase the number of basketballs that you're releasing from the reservoirs, and that's where the tunnel solution set comes in. If we have an, an open design tunnel system that's permanently discharging and we never shut the gates, well then we can discharge 15,000 basketballs in a tunnel on a continuous basis, keeping the reservoirs largely dry year round until we have a sudden rainfall event and still have the ability to open up the gates on the reservoirs and still release 15,000. So you'd have a total maximum release of, of doubling what we, what we had prior to Hurricane Harvey. That's largely what we're doing from a and an analytical perspective in terms of trying to develop a solution set um, where the tunnels largely don't increase the downstream flood risk, but combined between the tunnels and their ability to discharge, we're greatly reducing the frequency of, of those storm events that would have water leaving government owned land behind the reservoirs. And that's largely, you know, the focus of our objectives with Harris County Flood Control District. At the same time, if you want to increase capacity of those reservoirs, because because if you're close to the the federal property line, I get it. Every every bucket of dirt is potentially a bucket of water out of your home. Now it, it would require a massive expansion to make sure you know, of the reservoir and the tunnels to make sure that water doesn't leave government-owned land in a Hurricane Harvey type situation. But on on a storm storm events short of that. You know, if you want to be part of the solution set and, and help us move dirt behind those reservoirs, we have all the authority we need. We just have to, you just have to come to us with an idea, process a, 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 a what's considered a permission letter, which is a real estate out grant, and we'll make sure it's not going to do any damage to the, the structures of the reservoirs or increase the rate of rise to the reservoirs, and we can make that happen. Um, at the same time, you know, some of the capacity that, that you increase in the reservoirs allows us to improve, you know, give Harris County the, the authority to increase the amount of flow into the reservoirs. So it's a, it's a combined complex situation. 
Um, and, and we're working together with Harris County and anybody else who's got an idea uh, to, to move forward with the authorities we already have. And Ben, um, I just want to butt in here for a second because I, I think I heard something in the question um, that I would love just Colonel Vale and Alan, if you all can speak to a little bit more, which is, I think there is a frustration and I see it as I'm scanning some of these questions, um, you know, that, that doing the study um, and working on the long-term solution, people want to see sh the short-term solution or some, some immediate response. And I, and I definitely heard you talking about that, Colonel Vale, but what maybe wasn't as clear to me, but I think is true is that some of that is already happening some of it has happened. There are projects that you have done um, in terms of the dredging, in terms of cleaning up some of the channels and, uh, that go into Attics and Barker. I know Claudia on our team um, has worked with the Flood Control District over the last couple of years. A lot of people who are on here probably know Claudia um, from going to all the community meetings and other things. And I know that there have been some specific projects and some efforts that you've done. So I don't want uh, that to get lost in the conversation that it isn't like everybody's waiting to pick up a shovel until you know we can do the, the big final project. You are doing some of that work, some of that dredging work has happened and is ongoing. And I think that at least it's my sense there's a little frustration. People want to see both things happening. Um, and and my sense is that some of that is happening. So I just wanted to to put that out there and make sure that that my understanding is clear. Um, Alan, Colonel Vale, that that some of that work is already happening. It, it's not an either or. Um, but obviously we do have to make some big choices about what the long-term plan is going to be. Uh, but I just want to clarify that. I think that was part of the question. I just want to make sure that, um, that we cover that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Alan, sure. can, uh, well, Alan can speak to the specifics, but we're, we're very proud that all the funding received from, from Hurricane Harvey between the core and Harris County flood control district, we fully committed all that funding and, and improved, uh, most of the watersheds um, across Harris County. Um, Alan has, you want to talk the specifics? Sure, so the, the bond program alone uh, commits almost $200 million for projects in the Attics and Barker Reservoir watersheds. Um, a large majority of that is in the massive undertaking that I alluded to earlier, uh, where we're restoring all the tributaries that flow into the reservoirs back to their original design capacity. Um, getting the channels to function the way they're supposed to. Um, you know, that's the first piece of the puzzle and the, that's the, what we can do in the short term is to make sure that the, the infrastructure that the flood control district maintains are functioning properly. Um, so far, we've done a little bit of work uh, in cooperation with the core inside the, uh, the attics, for example. Um, but right prior to the, uh, the start of last year's hurricane season, uh, we did a, some, undertook some selective clearing of South Mady Creek downstream of Greenhouse uh, to try and help facilitate that water getting into the reservoir without impacting the rate of rise at the, uh, at the dam. So we're doing what we can. Uh, we do have, like I said, close to $200 million dedicated just to those two watersheds. Um, and we're, uh, we're, we're committed to executing every single one of those projects. Thanks so much for clarifying that. And, uh, you know, we, Sometimes we know so much in, in the details of these projects, and I think it's just um, important for people to know that you hear them. Uh, this is something we've certainly heard from folks in our district, and I know it's what I hear back from you all, that we're trying to do everything we can. You're trying to do everything you can at once. So thanks for clarifying that. And I'll turn it back to Ben. Thanks for letting me butt in there. Thank you, Congresswoman. And time has really flown on this, so we do have time for one last question here. Uh, Cynthia Neely uh, would like to request an update on the TER 17 detention basis project and where that stands and what the timeline for that looks like. Yeah, thank you, Ben. I'm going to talk real quick so we can get another question in. And, and previously I mentioned it was TER 7, it's actually TER 17. We have selected the consultant. We're currently in the process of negotiating the scope and hopefully we'll get that resolved pretty quickly and then we'll have, we'll move forward with the design effort. Great, thank you, Steve. And uh, since you were so concise there, I think we can get one more in. Um, we have a audience member asking to, if we can get an update on recommendations coming out of the core study that was initiated in 2018 for the uh, Houston Regional Watershed Assessment, uh, where that stands and how that is overall going. Yeah, largely, so that watershed assessment is largely complete. And I think um, the, the biggest components of that is the recommendation from the core that uh, 
you know, we create a, a regional forum uh, to conduct integrated water resource management across um, the federal government's authorities, the Texas Water Development Board's authorities, the county's authorities, and the city's authorities. Uh, also branch out to the other federal agencies uh, to be part of that. Um, we've got the framework of that within the Texas Water Development Board's Region Planning Group 6. Um, so we're moving forward uh, with the Texas Water Development Board to try and implement kind of a holistic uh, you know, approach to, to planning and programming and selecting the, 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 the best water uh, flood risk mitigation projects we can across the, the 22 watersheds. Yeah, just, uh, ben, just as a follow up to what the Colonel was saying, I'm on that regional board and actually we met today for our monthly meeting. Our report, our comprehensive report, which does integrate a lot of the recommendations that the Corps has, has recommended here locally uh, into our regional plan, we anticipate that we'll have a regional plan draft submitted to the state in, in August. And so it should be it should be available for public consumption. We're going to have several public meetings between now and then to brief the public on what we're doing in terms of the regional effort. I'll add one little part is that say that there's one person or one representative missing in this organ in this group here tonight, and we've just now talked about them. And it really highlights the collaboration across the board for bringing flood resilience to, to Harris County. It's the state. The state is in the flood planning game as well, not just in planning for the future uh, flood resiliency, but also investing funding in projects in this area. The Flood Control District's been successful in securing some grant funding from the state, as has the city of Houston and many other agencies. So, you know, it just highlights, again, the importance of those partnerships and the collaboration at the local, state, and federal level. So, uh, again, my thanks go out to, to everybody who's, who's helping to, uh, to do our job to, to, to make things better here. Great. Well, thank you all so much for participating uh, with us tonight on the panel. And I'd like to thank all of our uh, listeners and watchers this evening for taking part in this very important conversation. Uh, hearing about all the work that's going on throughout the region and through the community is so important uh, to making sure that all the community's needs are met, uh, as there are a variety of needs across the county and city. Uh, and with that, I will pass it to the Congresswoman uh, for her final remarks for the evening. And thank you again for participating. Great, Ben. Thank you so much for um, for moderating the discussion and giving my voice a rest. Um, I, I obviously pushed it a little bit a minute ago, so I will be very brief in just thanking our panelists um, again for spending an hour with us tonight to update everyone in the 7th Congressional District about the work that you're doing and also the way that you're working together. I think it's something that I talk about a lot in Washington um, about how we work in this community. I think it's something that we've seen since day one. People want to see. Um, flooding, flood mitigation, water conveyance continue to be top of mind for everyone. Um, and as we know, going into hurricane season over the summer, as we know, um, with all the challenges we face, this just has to be a priority for our community and has to be something we're always working on. And I think that the conversation tonight um, hopefully demonstrated to everyone that we are, uh, but that their input is really important too. I tried to summarize a bunch of those questions because I think it it is important um, to recognize how much you all have listened to the constituents who, who I know we're talking to you or talking to me, um, we're all talking to each other. Um, and so to see that reflected in the Harris County bond program in 2018, to see that reflected in the CORE's work and going back and taking another look at the tunnels, this really is a collaborative effort that isn't just about the agencies and the representatives, it's about the people who are participating tonight in figuring out how we're going to solve this problem and the best way we can do it is solving it together. Um, so hopefully we got to all of the questions. Um, if you didn't get your question answered, obviously my office is here, my team is here, Ben is here, Claudia is here, who I mentioned earlier, um, is here in Houston working on flooding issues. and. Um, and has been a part of so many of these conversations. And I think it's um, it's just important for you all to know that we're here for you um, and that we can be your voice in Washington and working on these issues with the core, working here at home, and then bringing these issues and doing things like coming up with the funding to complete the Myergrove detention base. And Alan, you didn't mention it, but I think it's, it's important to note that Harris County Flood Control said that they are gonna break ground this fall and hopefully it's gonna be ready next spring. So that is a really quick project moving. Um, and I'm so glad to be able to bring 
the money to do it and a little bit more to the flood control district, almost $10 million to make sure that that project can move forward. Uh, but it's the kind of thing where everybody worked together immediately after Harvey to identify um, a problem and a solution. And, and we've, we've come together to do that. And that's what our community is going to have to continue to do. The bigger picture discussions about regional um, flood planning and mitigation, the long-term study, um, you know, this affects our entire region. And I think that some of the, the points that I heard tonight um, are really important for me to take with me um, and think about how all these little projects that we can do can add up and how these big projects uh, that we are looking at have the power to be so transformative for our region. Uh, but it's going to take all of us working together to make them happen. So I just really appreciate the conversation tonight. I want to remind everybody who's participating um, that you can call my office anytime to share your thoughts on this, ask questions. Uh, we're here to help. My phone number 713-353-8680 here in Houston. Um, again, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, as I've said, I haven't been able to say a word for about three days, but it seems fitting uh, that the first words that I can say after that um, are about flooding um, and what we're doing together as a community to respond. So thank you all so much for being here for your time tonight and for participating and, and being part of the solution. And again, um, to Colonel Blackman, who's going to be joining us this summer, we're delighted to welcome you um, into our community and, and excited for you to get here to Colonel Vale who has been just such an incredible visionary leader and a real partner um, in helping us rethink how we do things. Um, you know, we will miss you in this role, but um, I know I am excited and I think everybody here is excited to see what you do next and to continue working with you on these issues uh, for our community. So thank you. Thanks to Alan and Steve um, and thanks to everybody participating. So glad to be with y'all tonight. Take good care and we'll see you again soon.